On Tech News Today, Gox goes bankrupt, how to intercept phone calls using Google Maps, and Microsoft might lower the price of Windows to free. All that and more coming up next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's Friday, February 28th, 2014, and this is Tech News Today. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT2. And by Shutterstock.com. With over 28 million high quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, Go to Shutterstock.com and use the offer code TNT214. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin, and Jason Howell is off today. On Tech News Today, we explore the most important stories of the day in conversation with the world's leading journalists. Our guest co-anchor this week is Natalie Morris, a contributor to the Today Show, CNBC, the Queen Latifah Show, and a former anchor for CNET TV. She's also the co-founder of ReadQuick, a speed-reading app for iOS. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning. Well, it's good afternoon from the East Coast. That's right. That's right. And it's good evening in uh, London. Well, you know what tomorrow is, Natalie? Tomorrow, tomorrow. is March 1st. That's right. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's yeah. Yahoo's 19th birthday. Yahoo turns 19 tomorrow. It's actually the 19th birthday of the renaming of the site to Yahoo. Before that, it was, uh, what was it? It was somebody's so-and-so World Wide Web uh, site or something like that. It was a really bogus name. Anyway, somebody named Tom M. Say posted pictures of Yahoo's party preparations on Flickr, complete with a cake, cupcakes, and what else? Balloon unicorns. Oh, is that what that is? That's what that, that was. Yeah. Go back. Yeah. we And uh, this is the big party. They're going to have tons of balloons and, you know, it's very exciting. I remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember when Yahoo was the hot new startup when uh, their IPO made everybody think that, uh, you know, tr contributing to the bubble that everybody could get rich. And everybody mm -hmm. did get rich off the Yahoo. And everybody who was involved, and interns became millionaires. It was a crazy IPO. And they kind of started the whole dot-com craze uh, for a long time. But 19 years old, that's pretty old. Two, two more years and they'll be able to legally drink alcohol. I think this sort of turning of the coolness of Yahoo was when they had those commercials with a pillow tied to the dog. The guy in the yeah, yeah. motor home. That was yeah. great. Yeah, that, that was, was great. fun. Those were yeah. the days. Those were the days. Well, now they're struggling for the, the their survival and for the future, trying to compete with Google and so on. Well, well, now they're trying to figure out what they are. Back then, it was so easy. It was like if you're on a motorhome in the middle of a desert and you see a meteor coming to you, you go to Yahoo and get a pillow. That's right. That's what they did. Now they don't do that anymore, I guess. Yeah. They just buy companies and then they later close them. That seems to be what their main business is. Right. Maybe they'll have a new birthday, though, because they could conceivably be the future of sort of video content or be a sure. new media type company. Right. We could soon be all working for Yahoo. So then they 19 years from now, we'll say this is the rebirth of Yahoo that was a search engine pillow dog delivering service. And now they're TV with Katie Couric. You can do it, Marissa. We, we believe in you. Well, let's uh, let's get to the news. Uh, I'm just going to come right out and say it. Mt. Gox is going bankrupt. The troubled Bitcoin exchange said today that 850,000 Bitcoins, including 100,000 owned by the company itself, is gone forever, and they're not going to be paying it back because they're declaring bankrupt bankruptcy. That's a total value of about $473 million, almost half a billion dollars. You know, this is, uh, this is quite an interesting development, Natalie, because uh, this could actually cause other Bitcoin exchanges to fail. Now, remember that Mt. Gox was once the dominant exchange for Bitcoins. They once had 80% of all Bitcoin trades going through Mt. Gox. And here they are uh, closing up shop, probably going bankrupt and really uh, just really collapsing. 
Right. It's just, it, it makes their argument that this is a safe place and it's so great that we don't have federal governments and insurance agencies behind us because it's easier. Well, then when that happens, there is no FDIC to insure your money. It's just poof, it's gone in the way, same way that poof, it was there. Um, so it, it's funny in the article that I read uh, about this on Reuters, I believe one of the quotes from the founders was like, you know, we're just going to make our departure from this marketplace as seamless as possible. The important thing is that this currency moves forward word without too much damage to its reputation. But it's like, hello, this is like the black mark on the face of this industry. That's right. People go into Bitcoins and, and, and buy them in, or mine them in significant numbers because they think, wow, you know, I could I could become a millionaire with this stuff. This could really become valuable, valuable, triple, uh, or, you know, increase by an order of magnitude, just become huge. And it's kind of a speculative thing for some people. Well, now this uh, this event will stick in the minds of people thinking, wow, I could lose everything. Um, I really don't think this is going to significantly affect the uh, survival, the long-term survival of Bitcoin, though, because I think a lot of Bitcoin uh, participants, if you will, are pretty small holders. I, I don't think there's a tiny number of very large holders. It's a whole bunch of people who have enough Bitcoins that they're willing to sacrifice that they need to. And uh, I don't think uh, there's going to be a flood away from this and a general collapse of Bitcoin itself or of cryptocurrency in general. I think cryptocurrency is here to stay and Bitcoin is a leader. I think it'll remain that way. This is just one hiccup on the way and sort of a wake up call to a lot of people who figured that, you know, it's everything's going to be OK. Because if you're if you uh, kept your Bitcoins at uh, Mount Gox, no, it's not going to be OK. Uh, nope. this, is, this is over and you lost the money. And of course, so did Mount Gox. They lost a whole lot of Bitcoins. The hacker on Justified put the money in Bitcoin this, as well. If you saw that episode, you know what that means. But so it's definitely part of the pop culture. It's definitely part of a diversified portfolio. Yeah, you're right. Most people aren't going to put all of their money there. And so in the spectrum of like money in the mattress, money in the bank, money in Bitcoin is somewhere in between. Well, in a second, we're going to learn how to how to intercept a phone call using Google Maps. I'm serious. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own website or online portfolio. And this is a fantastic site. Now, if you're going to build a website, if you're going to put up a website on the Internet for any reason, you want to make sure that it looks awesome. There are lots and lots of websites out there that look horrible. And if you are competing with other people with a small business or if you have a blog and you're trying to get uh, followers and readers... Having a beautiful Squarespace site is going to give you an enormous advantage. And it's not just beauty. It's also going to give you an advantage in terms of performance. Because you can throw millions of uh, people, tons of traffic at a Squarespace site, and they will simply uh, uh, throw all the processing power necessary to handle any amount of traffic at it. So it, it doesn't go down. It, uh, it, it read, uh, orients itself for mobile devices. You've got to look great on mobile devices. Lots of people build a website on a with a laptop or a desktop computer, and they kind of forget about the mobile device. People come along with an iPhone or an Android phone, and it looks terrible. Not on Squarespace. It doesn't happen. You don't have to do anything different or special to make your site on Squarespace look awesome on a mobile device. It happens automatically. Now, of course, you uh, you start with templates. So it's super easy to start with uh, one of their 25 beautiful templates. And you know what? You can just build a website with one template. You can tinker with it, look at it. Ah, you don't like it? Scrap it. Go try another template. Uh, it's You have enormous freedom. And once you uh, tweak it with their easy-to-use tools, you'll end up with a completely unique website on the Internet. If you need help, of course, they have tech support 24 hours a day, seven days a week through live chat and email. It's great tech support, too, by the way. They also have customer help site for uh, easy access to self-help articles. So they'll teach you how to learn to become a much better website uh, manager, a much better uh, blog blog publisher. Uh, there's lots and lots of really, really good information in there. Now, of course, they now support e-commerce. So if you want to sell something, if you want to put up an online store, if you want to take donations, if, you have, if you're getting married and you want to, to, to have a wedding registry, if you want to do a school fund drive, anything that requires taking money used to be super, super complicated. Now it's very easy. Uh, Squarespace, just uh, you just choose that option in Squarespace and set up, go through a simple step-by-step -step process and then you are able to actually sell things on the internet. Sounds expensive, right? Well, it's only $8 a month, and that includes a free domain name. Of course, that's a starting cost. There are lots of other options, but uh, it, you, you should remember that this is a, a, a really nice site, not only for looking at uh, 
uh, your site on a mobile device, but also managing it with their Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad. I want to tell you about one more thing. If you have a small business and you want a cool logo, you can create your own using their logo, logo creator tool. This is a really fantastic resource. So start a free two-week trial today with no credit card required and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code TNT2 to us for the month of February to get 10% off and to show your support for Tech News Today. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. And remember that a better website awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Well, earlier this week, a network engineer named Brian Seeley used Google Maps to intercept and secretly record a phone call placed to the FBI office in San Francisco and to the Secret Service in Washington, D.C., I'm serious. This actually happened, and in fact, it's easy to do. Natasha Atiku is the co-editor of Valley Wagon. She's here to explain uh, what happened here. Welcome, Natasha. Hi. Thanks for having me. So, how do you hack a phone? How do you hack phone calls using Google Maps? Well, um, as a, as a few people have pointed out, it's not exactly a hack. Um, in, in the way that it involves code, it's more like you are exploiting loopholes that Google has let. Is that Google's been aware of for years um, to create fake listings. So basically, because the information on Google Maps is crowdsourced, they just open it up and say, hey, you know, if you know the phone number of this business, just plug in the phone number. That means that anybody can essentially do it, right? And then once you can put in a fake phone number, you can sort of take control of that call. Is that what happened in this case? Um, in this case, he uh, it was a little bit more complicated to create these government listings. He started with MapMaker and then tweaked them using Google Places, where they had just earlier this month put in more quality control. But um, so he managed to get these listings to rank second in both cases. So if you you know aren't that savvy and you're looking it up through Google Maps, there you go. You think that's the FBI's number. So the correct phone number was ranked first in, in the search, but then the incorrect one was ranked second, and enough people went to the second uh, result that uh, he was able to actually intercept calls that were meant for the FBI and Secret Service. Yeah, I would do that. And then, so could it have been that those callers had tried the FBI original number and was like, oh, that's too long, maybe the second number is legitimate? And do you think he was doing this because he wanted to point out this vulnerability, not because he actually wanted to pretend he was a secret service or whatever. Oh, he did it because, um, so in the past, uh, he isn't a network engineer by training, but in the past, he's also, Brian Seeley, he has made money from spamming Google Maps. It's a very lucrative cottage industry. Um, there's a number of people that do it. And uh, in this case, though, I think he had a change of heart and he wanted Google to um, close up these loopholes Google was being not responsive and, um, you know, hackers have a little bit of an ego sometimes. And so uh, he started trolling them just with funny things at first, you know, putting up um, an adult bookstore on the Google campus, um, various things through this Twitter account called Maptivist. And they were able to find those pretty quickly. And he still wasn't being taken seriously. I mean, this is a man who knows where all the loopholes are because he's made money right. off of them. And he has contact information for all of the spammers you know, who uh, he alleges make like can make like $10 million a year. Um, so I think this was just to get their attention. And he actually went into, let's see, the... It was a secret service. He went into the secret service and played these phone calls and got right. one of them. Right. So he was trying to what? get himself caught. No, he wasn't trying to get himself. Well, the thing is, he had alerted the FBI and the Secret Service that he had done this. And I don't think he got a response from the FBI. I still haven't gotten one. And he didn't get one until after the article or uh, at some point yesterday afternoon. Um, so the reason he went into the Secret Service is uh, he's a former Marine. He's done work for, um, you know, he's helped out certain government projects before. So he asked a buddy in the FBI, like, how much trouble am I going to get into for recording these things? And uh, he said, you should just go into the Secret Service in Washington and, you know, turn yourself in. And what happened is, you know, they're not really believing him just like Google hasn't and um, no one's taking him seriously. And then he gets a notification on his phone that a call has just been intercepted. And it is a Washington 
uh, DC police officer calling Secret Service about an active investigation. And that's when they were like, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, uh, patted him down. Now, after they talked to him, they, there was a, a Secret Service agent, a special agent who called him a hero for bringing this to their attention. Uh, is, is that is that uh, is that correct that they actually called him a hero for bringing this to to the public's uh, attention? Well, um, I asked uh, the Secret Service specifically to fact check that, but mm -hmm. they didn't. However, I saw a correspondence between a special agent in the um, in the Seattle office and Brian Seely, where Brian mentioned it, and uh, the special agent said, "I think he wanted some kind of a plaque or like, <laughs> you know, yeah. he was like, this is the this is a proud moment for me." Um, and so the special agent was like, "Yeah, I think that can be done." Huh. And he mentioned, um, you know, being called a, you know, th that guy who called me a hero, and uh, so it's. It seems legitimate to me that that was a word that was thrown around when he turned himself in. Well, that's the only but way Google things like... Google doesn't seem to think this is very heroic, right? They don't see oh, the irony in it. Yeah. They, no, are, no. What, is their, what is their response? Do you know? Their response to me has been nothing. Um, they said that they were looking into it, and um, that was yesterday uh, early afternoon. Uh, I sent them the article when it was up. Haven't heard anything at all. Well, thank you for coming on and uh, telling us about this uh, story, Natasha. Appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. All right. Well, you can find Natasha uh, on Twitter. I'm going to spell her name, N-I-T-A-S-H-A-T-I-K-U, and also, of course, on Gawker.com. It's so punk rock. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Well, Microsoft is experimenting with a free version of Windows 8.1. The version is called Windows 8.1 with Bing, and would come with Microsoft apps and services targeting Windows 7 users, you know, to coax them to upgrade. With us is Brad Chacos, a senior writer for PC World. Welcome, Brad. Hey, thanks for having me. Can you tell us more about what Microsoft might be planning here? Um, yeah, sure. So basically, uh, Microsoft recently reorganized to get into device and services business. And uh, they simply can't price compete with Chromebooks and Android because of the cost of a Windows license. So last week it came out that uh, they're looking to reduce the cost of a license for devices under $250. And they're also looking to reduce the footprint of Windows 8 so uh, that it can run on devices with fewer hardware specs so that, you know, maybe they can sell devices cheaper. And uh, around the same time, this mysterious leak build come out called uh, Windows 8.1 with Bing. It actually looks an awful lot like the standard version of Windows 8.1, according to reports. Um, but recently, um, uh, The Verge's Tom Warren and uh, Windows Weekly's own Mary Jo Foley reported that uh, what it actually is is uh, an experimental version of Windows that Microsoft is developing and playing around with to uh, offer for a very low price to get Windows 7 users to upgrade. And it is theoretically going to focus on pushing and promoting Microsoft services, playing into the device and services angle of their company now. Although you can't see that in the build right now, according to various reports. Now this is probably a test or an experiment, right? I mean, there, this isn't locked in like a, a done deal. No, this is not a done deal. This is, you know, as I said, it looks pretty much exactly the same as Windows 8 right now. Both uh, Foley and Warren, who uh, reported that it is a test from their own Microsoft sources, have said that it is a test, it is an experiment. They're just trying to figure out a way to bring Windows 8 to more people for cheap while replacing that Windows license cost with uh, Microsoft services such as OneDrive, Xbox Video, you know, Office 365, services that they can charge for year after year after year rather than getting this one-time Windows license. And is there a business model in maybe collecting revenue from, say, OEMs or um, other revenue sources, which would then make it really and truly the end of the paid operating system to consumers? Uh, that's... I mean, theoretically, that's kind of what Google does. Microsoft's built a little bit differently. Um, yeah. I think it's a little too early to say anything like that right about now. Uh, Windows revenue still makes a ton of money for Microsoft. So we'll have to see, basically. 
it's still an experiment. It's still a toy. It's nothing official. This, so. that's, this, the, that's the dream, right? For us, anyway. Yeah. That it all works out for everyone. Yes, that would be great. So, now, this, this kind of reminds me of the announcement that we heard earlier in the week uh, that said uh, Microsoft was reducing the hardware requirements to run Windows Phone. And that initiative was associated with the new CEO, Satya Nadella. I wonder if all of this, the, to, to get Windows cheaper on lower cost hardware so that you can have much higher user base and spread all over the world, not just in the uh, expensive uh, markets and the rich countries. Uh, I wonder if that's a Satya Nadella initiative that he's driving this uh, to 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 radically ramp up uh, user user uh, you know usage and 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 acceptance uh, of of Windows generally. Do you think there's a possibility of that, or is this uh, is it, was all this in motion before Satya Nadella got into office? Um, I can't be sure, but I mean, it was under Steve Ballmer that this reorganization happened. It's a company wide initiative. Um, I think it just more plays into the fact, the way the world's going. I mean, Apple is lo no, letting users upgrade for free for OS X. Android's entire business, Google's entire business is built around pushing devices and services. And I think that's kind of the way the world's moving. And Microsoft is trying to figure out how to keep up with that. Um, because once, you know, computer makers get used to getting Chromebooks and Android operating systems for free, it's awful hard to eat a $50 device cost. Yeah for uh windows books that's a good point yeah. well well brad i want to thank you for coming on thank you nice uh talking to you all right well you can find brad chacos uh at pcworld.com and also on twitter at brad chacos c-h-a-c-o-s that's it that's right <laughs> well a california appeals court yesterday ruled that it's legal in the state to look at a map on your phone while driving which is a big relief because i do it all the time uh uh, now, um, Natalie, this is uh, this is an interesting and kind of strange development, uh, I think, because of course we've been covering the Google Glass story, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know the woman, um, I think it was Cecilia Abadie, is how you pronounce her last name, uh, yeah. was essential, essentially exonerated, but the but the law that she was ticketed for was a law in California that says you can't look at any screen while you're driving. And the reason that she was found innocent is that they couldn't prove that her screen was on. But here a judge is saying, hey, the law doesn't ban you from looking at maps on your smartphone. Oh, it's just getting all cuckoo because we know that the cell phone can distract us while we're driving, but we also buy them with GPS so that we can use them as a personal navigator. So how do you prove one over the other? It's, you know, it's just... So I, I, I'm going to give you a little insight into my life. So this week I had to go to traffic court because I got a ticket for using my phone on the road. Now, I was at a dead stoplight and I was looking on Google Maps, but the officer said, you can't use your phone at all. And I was driving in Manhattan. My son had just potty trained and he was screaming that he needed a bathroom. But he said, because you were using your right thumb it means you were doing stuff on wow. it. And I was like, I wasn't actually like I, it was on the, I, it was on the um, armrest and I picked it up and I was scrolling through the map to see where I could pull over to get, let him go to the bathroom. And I don't text and drive. I'm pretty hard on myself about that, but they couldn't prove, I couldn't prove anything, whether I was using a map or whether I was nothing. So um, the judge, you know, she was lenient. She said minimum fine in traffic court and just, you know, be more careful, but it's still, it doesn't make sense. Like you should be able to use that for that function. And like we talked about earlier this week, we have the technology now to block out the other stuff. So when that technology finally gets to the mass market, then maybe we won't see this kind of cuckoo craziness. Well, you could also just move out of the authoritarian state of New York and New Jersey uh, and uh, come to California where we live free and breathe. Right. Clean but air. California was one of the first states to have a hands-free law. It was like in the top 10 yeah, of the I'm being, states. Yeah. And I think probably it just, it makes no sense for this to be state by state, especially here in the Northeast where our states are like cities. They're so tiny that you can cross through three in about two hours. How do you know what's the rule from state to state? There needs to be more federal, what more agreed upon federal legislation for this, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and the other Sensible. thing that... Right. 
Yeah, good luck. Uh, federal sensual legislation. Yeah, that, uh, good luck with that. Well, you know, yeah. th this is um, this could be appealed, of course, and I think the more likely outcome is that it'll cause the state legislature to clarify what the rules are for what you can look at, what you can't look at. Can you look at a screen? If you do have a screen, does it have to be a map? What is a map? You have to define what a map is and so on. So uh, I'm sure they'll be um, messing around with this for a couple of years, and eventually we'll get to the point where police will pretty much be able to ticket you for whatever they want. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, the bottom line is that people just need to be safe. Whether you're looking at maps, not looking at maps, wearing Google Glass, not wearing Google Glass, don't be distracted. Keep your eyes on the wheel, on the road, and keep your hands on the wheel. And, you know, don't, don't be a jackass. Be a yes, yeah. there you go. I mean, yeah, how can, you know, I was all against wearing Google Glass behind the wheel, and I still am. You should be able to, maybe the the justification is you look at a map, but you don't pick it up, right? Or you don't, I don't know, like there needs to be some kind of delineation of we know that that was okay, but this wasn't. And yeah, you're right. Safety needs to be the number one priority. But at the same time, then it's not safe to not know where I'm going either. That's right. Yep. And there are, there are other just, you know, people used to look at paper maps while driving, uh, you know, open them up on the string. Well, I've seen people do that. So hopefully the, and, and, you know, it's likely that whatever laws come out, they'll have a technology bias against, you know, they'll ban technology oriented distractions and essentially leave legal non-technology based distractions like eating a sandwich or putting on makeup and all that stuff. So right. uh, that's just. Soon the Google self-driving car will just be able to tell us what laws we're breaking and how to stop it. For instance, I'm still relatively new to the East Coast. I didn't realize that it's illegal to have snow flying off your car. <laughs> you have to get the snow off because if you're driving and then some like big chunk falls on the person behind you, that makes you a jackass. So um Maybe, you know, there's just some kind of database and Google Drive is like, you can't put on that mascara. Also clean the snow off your car and also quit, you know, looking at this YouTube video or whatever. Well, I'm just proud to say like that I... Like a total I, big brother. Yeah, I'm proud to say that I never, ever put on mascara while I'm driving. Oh, ever. well, that's good of you. Yes. That well, must take some restraint. Yes, it's difficult. <laughs> well, Google updated Hangouts for iOS and some writers are saying that it's better even than the Android version and that it looks a lot more like Messenger and WhatsApp. Uh, Kurt Wagner is a social media reporter for Mashable, and he's here to explain it. Welcome, Kurt. Hey, thanks for having me. So what's different in the new Hangouts for iOS? Uh, the major difference is that they totally re uh, redesigned it um, at first. And so now when you look at the app, uh, it will, if you're familiar with WhatsApp or if you're familiar with Facebook Messenger, they're going to look really similar. Um, they've always had where uh, you can look at all of your conversations, you see the people that you're messaging, um, there are pictures in a small circle on the left-hand side of the screen, but they've added tabs along the bottom of the app now uh, where you can toggle between your favorites or your messages and your contacts, and that's very similar to uh, uh, how both Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp are set up. So um, in terms of looks, they're similar, and then they've also added some new features. Uh, you can now share with people uh, your exact location, you can send uh, video files as well as uh, pictures, which you could already do. And you can add things like um, what they call stickers or emojis, essentially little cartoons, smiley faces, things like that. So uh, all in all, it looks a lot familiar to what we've seen from uh, Facebook's now two standalone messaging services. Yeah, and But unlike just some of the apps that are written for tweens, this has a business application as well. My husband was just pointing out that you can attach documents now instead of just images. Yeah, and the thing that also I, I believe makes it uh, helpful for businesses, you know, it's tied to your Gmail. And for those people who use Gmail professionally and, and every day for work, uh, it's convenient to have all of your business professional contacts as part of uh, your network there, whereas you may not be friends with those people on Facebook, you may not be a connection with them on WhatsApp, but if you have, a, you know, connected with them over Gmail, they'll show up in your messenger. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the new version also embeds a map of your location. So when you click on the location to tell whoever it is you're chatting with where you are, it'll actually put a map with the pin showing them where you are uh, into the message. Now, I I'm curious about something uh, though, Kurt, uh, this is obviously, you compared it in, in your article to, to Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Now, uh, Hangouts has not only all the basic things that both of those uh, services offer, uh, but it also has things that they don't offer yet, like you can do phone calls. You can just, uh, you know, uh, of course, WhatsApp announced recently that they intend in the future 
to add phone calls. You can already do that with iOS. They support SMS. They do all the basic things that these other messaging applications do. Why isn't Hangouts more popular, you think? That's a really good question, and it's something that um, you know I actually think about often. Is why is Google Plus in general the social network that Google has? Why why is that always kind of deemed um, certainly on a different lower level than Facebook and Twitter and and a lot of these other social networks? And I think the the big thing is that um, you want to be where all of your friends and your your colleagues are. Um, and Facebook for the longest time has been that service for people and now even twitter has a, a messaging service so a lot of people feel that they can use twitter uh, to message back and forth and then you throw linkedin into the situation and you can message your professional contacts through linkedin so i think there's just a lot of competitors and i think that people as they start to use hangouts if they haven't used it before if they put it on their phone perhaps it'll grow on them a little bit but um you know google also added these features uh, a couple months after the the competitors did so people have become familiar with whatsapp or with google uh, facebook messenger excuse me so perhaps they they've already decided you know this has been working for me and they don't need another messaging app and i think there's also something to be said for the single function application whatsapp was just for messaging mm -hmm. to replace your text messaging whereas hangouts was embedded in the new google plus and it was a feature of that that also could stand alone and i think that's just too confusing if you're going to launch a product you know like hangouts and you want it to just be one to one personal communication that's one thing but hangouts can also be one to many um, there are also broadcast channels. Some of the major networks are using that. So I think most people are like, wait, what? Is that the same thing that I watched this other thing on? So that's a that's a marketing. I think that's a marketing failure. And my own my own opinion, uh, uh, Kurt, and I want to know what you think about this is that WhatsApp has uh, one of their killer features of WhatsApp is that it ties into your contacts database. You don't have to go out there and build a social what what. Uh, Zuckerberg would call a social graph, build up, you know, your contacts from scratch, you just tie it right into your existing uh, phone network. And with Facebook Messenger, it ties into your Facebook followers and friends. And of course, everybody's on Facebook. But then Google Plus and Hangouts, they, they're tied to your Google Plus circles. And you're not going to have everybody in your uh, Google Plus circles if you're an average user. You're not going to have all your family and friends. You're not going to have all your business colleagues. You'll have certain people. You know, Google Plus is a great site to discover and interact with brilliant strangers, I like to say. But WhatsApp uses your contact database and Facebook uses your, your Facebook graph. And that's where you're the people you already know are. I think that Google's big, big failure here is their failure to develop Google Contacts, mm -hmm. which as a standalone app is horrible. It's super slow. It seems really outdated. And they really haven't done anything with it. And if, in fact, Google has recently admitted that they haven't done anything with Google Contacts. So they need to build and integrate Google Contacts with Google Plus in a way that's really compelling so that Hangouts uh, uses the contacts that you have uh, just like WhatsApp does. And I think when they do that, it'll make a lot more sense uh, to people. What do you think of that theory? Yeah, I think absolutely, because uh, what do we all carry around in our pockets every day? We carry around our cell phones and our smartphones, and those are tied to our mobile numbers. And that's how we text people. That's how we, uh, you know, call people. And so you look at the apps that have been successful in really building a strong audience and, and a strong community. And uh, it's oftentimes the apps that use your mobile contacts as uh, the people that you're engaging with. And Facebook actually tried to do that. In the fall, they changed Messenger so that you can add your mobile number to uh, Facebook Messenger and therefore connect with people who you might not be Facebook friends with. Um, obviously, it, I'm not sure exactly how that turned out because then they bought WhatsApp. So my guess is that it wasn't going as well as they had hoped. But um, you look at another site like Snapchat. I mean, you can look up people within your uh, uh, your mobile contact list in order to find them on Snapchat. And that's another reason that that uh, service has been so popular. So yes, having your mobile number attached your identity. I mean, they go hand in hand because you're carrying your phone everywhere. All right, Kurt. Well, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. You can find Kurt at Mashable.com and also on Twitter at Kurt Wagner 8. Please ignore Kurt Wagner's 1 through 7. He's <laughs> Kurt Wagner yes. 8. Thanks exactly. again. Thanks. Well, in a sec, I'm going to tell you about a blocky movie coming out, but first I want to tell you about Shutterstock. Shutterstock is my secret weapon as a blogger. I have a what I hope is a very successful blog 
on Google+, and one of the reasons it's uh, successful is that it's highly visual. We live in the visual internet, and if you don't have brilliant, stunning images on your blog, you're basically not going to have a very interesting blog, and you're certainly not going to have a popular blog. There are lots of places to get images, but they're, in my case, you know, sometimes I, I'll, I'll write about the iPhone, and, and I'll use a picture of the iPhone that's been pr provided by Apple or something like that, I'll write about technology or write about people, and those pictures kind of take care of themselves. But oftentimes, I'm writing about concepts, and I need photos to go with those. And you can't just go to Google Images and grab a photo. That's, that's neither uh, the right thing to do, nor is it unnecessarily legal and it's certainly not fair to the people and the artists and the photographers who created those images. So the right way to do it is to buy your images and it's very, very inexpensive to do on Shutterstock. And there's such an amazing selection. Shutterstock adds 20,000 images every single day. And these are uh, many of these are done by professional photographers and artists. So they're really, really great. Uh, I've, I've posted so many Shutterstock images on my blog and people ask, you know, where'd you get that? I always tell them, you know, Shutterstock. It's a, it's a great idea for anyone who has a website of any kind. If you have a business that requires images, you can't have a, a website that's ugly, that isn't visual. You've got to be visual. We live in a visual uh, world these days. So Shutterstock, um, uh, the way this works is you basically just go to the site and you search for whatever you're looking for. And I love the search engine there because it's not just like searching for objects. You don't just, you, you, you can search for much more than just show me a picture of this, show me a picture of that. You can drill down by color. You can say, show me orange things. You can, you can uh, talk about file types. Show me, you know, uh, JPEGs only. You can search by gender and even emotion. You can, you know, and combine these searches to say things like, show me, you know, pictures of happy people, uh, you know, at the beach, uh, sad people at the beach. You can be very, very particular and get exactly what you want. And it's important to have a search engine like that because, again, they have so many images, 28 million high-quality images, illustrations, and vectors, and video clips on this site. So it's really an enormous uh, resource. Their iPad app is fantastic. I like to use their iPad app because I have a retina display on my iPad, and I go through there, and really, you can really get a, a, a fantastic and very quick look at all the images that you might be considering. Now, uh, let me give you an example of, of a uh, con conceptual search. If you want to write a blog post about Bitcoin, for example, just go in there and search for Bitcoin. You can choose the conceptual ones. You can show pictures that uh, have been drawn by computer-generated uh, software. You can see photography. You can see sort of black and white uh, icon iconography. Anything you want, it goes on and on and on to illustrate your point about Bitcoin. Because what else are you going to show when you're writing a, a blog post about Bitcoin? You've got to show something visual and stunning and, and look at all these options for something as new and, and, uh, and hard to, to, uh, to convey visually as Bitcoin. So you can try Shutterstock today by signing up for a free account, and I recommend that you do that. There's no credit card required. Just start an account and begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save favorite images to Lightbox to review later. Once you decide to purchase, use the offer code TNT214, and new accounts will receive 25% off. 25% off. That's an enormous savings. And, and, of course, that's on any package that you choose. That's Shutterstock.com. And for 25% off new accounts, go use the offer code TNT214. And we thank Shutterstock for their support of tech news today. Well, the Lego movie has dominated box offices for three weeks now. It's actually a really good movie. But now another block-oriented film is in the works. Warner Brothers may be working with Minecraft creator Marcus Person to create a live-action film, as in not animated, based on the open-world game. The studios acquired the rights to the movie, and now they're apparently looking for writers and directors. The original PC version of Minecraft has reached 100 million users. That was announced this week, and more, and about 14 million of those are paid users, which is pretty impressive. Person also, also intends to bring Minecraft to Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation Vita. And, of course, if you're interested in Minecraft, you should check out Twit's weekly show, OMG Craft, Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific. The show is hosted by Twit's Chad Johnson, who, let's face it, should really be the star of this movie. That's right. <laughs> he would be fantastic. In fact, we should we should get a big crowdsourced. Let's uh, cast it. We yeah, should cast it. Yes, we should. It'd be amazing. There's also yeah. a, I, I discovered in researching that this that there's also a uh, documentary about the making of Minecraft on YouTube. So check that out. It's like an hour and forty five minutes about how they made Minecraft and 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 where it came from. Well, Natalie, I'd like to thank you uh, for guest anchoring all week long. This has been a fantastic week because you were here as our co-anchor. Oh, thank you for saying that. I've had a good time. Well, thanks. Like I said, it gave me an excuse to get showered every day. Yeah, well, we uh, 
we want to make sure that jeans. you're clean every day, so we'll have to have you back so you take All a right. shower. Good. All right. Well, thanks again. Well, yeah, thanks for the invitation, everyone. All right. Well, if you like breaking news on Twitter, you make sure you check out our Twitter feed, Twit News. That's Twit News with no space uh, on Twitter. Subscribe to Tech News today at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us at TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a voicemail by calling 260-TNT-SHOW. And please subscribe to our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can follow our social pages by searching for Tech News Today on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and YouTube. And also, don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every weeknight. Uh, so I thank you for tuning in today and all week. My name is Mike Elgin, and we'll see you Monday.